but the general idea that you had no control over your life went on for generations. So that terror, that, that brutality, that, that fear of destruction, that fear of hurt, was something that was a constant part of our environment over multiple generations. Multiple generations. So much so that after a period of time, you didn't know any other way. And you begin to believe that that's the only way to be. And it does not disappear in one generation. It does not disappear in two generations. It does not disappear in multiple generations because of the intensity of it. My, 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 my analogy, my metaphor, is to say in the same way that that one day of terror in New York has profoundly changed all that America its whole psychology has changed from one day event, multiply that by 300 years of similar events, and you'll have a better idea of why there is this continued post-traumatic syndrome, this post-traumatic stress syndrome that is the effects of slavery conditions. The slavery condition also was one of humiliation and inferiorization. Um, the idea that the Sleeks gave the story about the, 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 the rector of the university who uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, did, did, uh, could, not even, could not find a black doll, could not find a black doll for the child. That somehow this notion that, uh, that we did not even appreciate the degree to which we were taught to think of ourselves as inferior. An idea that somehow we were not as good as other people. Now, you cannot keep people in slavery unless you convince them that they deserve their plight. For many years, they even got biblical scriptures. They got the Bible to say, look, you were cursed. You were cursed by Noah. You were cursed by God. It got all mixed up because God didn't curse anybody. Noah did the cursing according to the story of the Old Testament. But the idea is that ministers used the argument that our condition of slavery was a condition that was prepared and intended by God. We were suffering a curse. We were suffering an humiliation that we were supposed to be in that condition. So a part then of making slaves cooperate with their slavery was to convince them they were getting what they deserved. So this idea of humiliation, making you feel that you are inferior, making you feel that you are less than, was a very key part. After slavery was over, and the argument was no longer a biblical-based one, it has continued in Western culture with the argument that something is implicitly wrong with the descendants of Africa. The idea that intellectually, we are not as intelligent, we are not as capable, we are not as able, we are prone to crime. There are a group of sociobiologists in the U.S. now who are trying to do experiments to find if there are in fact genetic determinants in young black boys to determine their likelihood of going to prison. That criminal behavior, they're arguing, actually has a biogenetic basis. All the, most of the early history of psychology has been geared towards trying to prove that black minds are not as capable intellectually as are white minds. All of the founding fathers, G. Stanley Hall and uh, uh, Louis Terman, and all of the early psychologists uh, uh, in, in America, in, in America especially, and to a great extent even in, in Europe and England particularly, they have spent most of their early research trying to argue that the intellect of blacks is different from the intellect of whites and black people are naturally, innately, biogenetically inferior to the, to the minds of white people. So the idea then is that the same inferiority that was used to make us slaves is now being argued that we don't have a right to be able to have the same education, we don't have a right to be able to live in the same areas, or to go into the same business, or to master the same skills. This whole argument that there is something basically wrong with all of us. Okay, the idea is that all of these kinds of conditions characterize the plantation. It's what I call the pathological or the diseased environment of the plantation. It was also characterized by 
the, the explicit effort to make sure that we did not develop intellectually. It differed on different colleges. But one of the things that was consistent was that education was kept away from the slaves. That it was considered to be dangerous for slaves to develop literacy. In the U.S., in many parts of the U.S., it was actually a punishable crime for a slave to learn how to read. That if they learn how to read, they actually could be punished for doing so. And if there were kind-hearted whites who actually helped them to learn to read, they could in fact be punished within their own legal system because it was against the law for a slave to be literate. Why? Ignorance was one of the major tools of keeping the slaves away from their own effectiveness. So to keep them away from learning basic skills. Now, that doesn't mean that there was a lot of information available anyway around the plantation to let them know who they really were. But without the skills of literacy, they were not permitted at all to get, gain any information about themselves. So uh, the ignorance was something that was maintained. Uh, the break with the African culture, uh, the break with the institutions that somehow helped us to know who we were and to build. Okay, let me move from that. That, that. That's the reality. Those are the things that, in varying degrees, we all had in common. There is no such thing as a good plantation. All plantations are plantations. There is no such thing as a good slave. The only kind of slavery that is acceptable is non-slavery. So the fact that some people suffered more than others is not an argument to say that therefore the system was different. The system was exactly the same. And we are, I submit to you, are still suffering from that kind of shared experience. Let's go to the next slide. To rush to this part. If you are saying to us, Akbar, which I'm not sure I believe, but suppose you are saying to us that this is a part of our condition. That this helps us to explain why it is that we still have difficulty determining our own fate. Why is it that whether we are in New York or in Curacao, we always end up being economically below the other people? Why is it that our children tend not to do as well in schools, whether you are in Atlanta, or whether you're in Kingston, Jamaica. Why is it that our children, economically, we don't seem to have the same power that other people have? Well, why is it, uh, you're saying, that somehow we cannot determine our fate politically the way that other people determine their fate? Why is it that we still have to send our children to be educated by other people? Why do they read books that don't tell them who they are, where they came from, and what they're all about? Why does each generation become less aware of who they are and what their responsibility is to the generations that brought them? Why are they unaware of the fact that the freedom that they had shared today is freedom that was gained by the struggles of people who came before them? Why then are we not able to exercise more control and determination about our lives? Why can't we celebrate our culture and still be part of a bigger culture? Why can't we be the same and yet be different? Why is it that Japanese can be Japanese American or be Japanese European, Japanese French or whatever they are, and they can have both of those cultures comfortably? Why can't you be, uh, uh, be like the other people who come from other cultures and can celebrate both of them and their culture of origin does not undermine the culture of their, uh, their, 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 current, uh, uh, their current living or uh, their current living situation? And the argument is, is that I suggest that because of these experiences that caused us to negate ourselves, to fear, to be angry about things that we